From the University District, this is your Daily Detroit. It's Thursday, February 7th, and I'm Sven Gustafson. And I'm Jer Stays. Today's show is made up entirely of an interview with a living Detroit legend. And to be honest, I couldn't be more excited. Paul Reiser is a trombonist and member of the Funk Brothers, the studio band for Motown Records. He played, wrote, and arranged songs for a who's who of Motown artists, everyone from Diana Ross and Aretha Franklin to The Temptations, The Four Tops, and Marvin Gaye. After Motown, Reiser worked with artists ranging from Carly Simon to The Rolling Stones, The Jackson 5, Pharaoh Sanders, Mary J. Blige, and Raphael Sadiq. I could go on and on. The list of credits for albums he's contributed to is an impressive one. Riser will be at the Detroit Institute of Music Education on Friday, February 8th, for a Paul Riser Masterclass, where he'll cover what he's learned from his incredible 50-year career. That's tomorrow from 1 to 3 p.m. at Dimes Downtown Detroit Campus at 1265 Griswold in Capitol Park. Sven asked Reiser all about his memories of working with some of Motown's biggest names and best studio musicians, plus what the changes in the music business have meant for musicians and modern music production. We also hear from Kevin Nixon, the president of the Detroit Institute of Music Education. That's right. Whether or not you're able to catch Reiser's appearance tomorrow at Dime, you definitely don't want to miss out on this interview. And thanks to the support of these two sponsors, we can present this special conversation uninterrupted. First, Milo Digital. They're a full-service digital marketing agency that engineers quality results through data and innovative strategies. Learn more about them at milodetroit.com. And second, Bamboo Detroit. With an inclusive community, flexible modern offices, classes, and networking events, Bamboo Detroit helps entrepreneurs and innovative companies launch, land, or expand in Detroit. Become one of their more than 400 members today at bamboodetroit.com. The bills are paid, Sven, so take it from here. Joining us by Skype is Paul Reiser, as well as Kevin Nixon, the president of Dime. Paul and Kevin, welcome to both of you. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for being here. Thanks for the welcome. Thank you. Mr. Reiser, you've been, you know, you're a veteran hand in the music industry, and you've seen it change like few people have, just seen fundamental changes in the music industry uh, to where we are nowadays with kind of on-demand streaming and away from, you know, sales of physical album products. What has that meant for musicians themselves who are trying to, you know, work in the industry and make a living? Well, of course, you know, it, it takes uh, pretty much a lifetime of practice and uh, lessons and playing in the orchestras and bands and whatnot for a musician to really uh, hone their skills. You know, it takes literally a lifetime practice every day to, to maintain a certain level of, of a proficiency. And, and that's never changed, right? It never changed. It's, all, it's true today as it was uh, 120 years ago. But uh, what's happening now is that the musicians who, who, whom we have learned to appreciate and enjoy because of their skill levels, like I just, just described, uh, they're finding it hard to, to find work, you know? Uh, because uh, naturally the electronics and the digital applications have come into play quite heavily. And uh, and just being very frank, put a lot of our great musicians out of work. And they've had to go get regular day jobs. Yeah. You were on the ground floor for Motown Records, which was always sort of unique in the sense that it was kind of like this one-stop shop, you know, in in addition to the traditional, you know, marketing promotions, the distribution that a record label does it, you know, you guys had teams of songwriters, uh, mu- uh, music arrangers such as yourselves, the, the, the right. studio musicians, the funk brothers of which you were one. Talk about the role for like music arrangers as you were in the modern era. I mean, I don't suppose there are many record labels that will employ music arrangers these days, are there? Not many, <laughs> not many at all. They're getting by as cheaply as they can, you know, and uh, it's what I call disposable music in a lot of respects. Yeah, when I came in, see, I come from a classical background, primarily. And um, number one, I hated R&B music, number one, okay? Really? I was classically trained. Oh, yeah. I hated it with a passion. I was classical, classically trained and and uh, 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 a jazz musician. Those two genres right there is where I, I pretty much uh, 
uh, laid laid my my wares down for, for those early years. Mm-hmm. And you graduated from from Cass Tech High too. Yes, yeah, Tech High School. Yes, what an institution! And uh, uh, from there, I came into Motown as a trombonist, not as an arranger. See. I came in as a, a trombonist because the Funk Brothers band needed a trombone player. Somebody couldn't make it for a session. So Dale Warren, who preceded me in, 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 from graduation at Cass uh, by about a year, he went to Motown, see? And he's the one who called me in to play trombone, all right? And uh, I sat next to the, to the proficient and great George Bohannon. Who, who at that point really showed me how to how to s- sit there in that hot seat and play and, and uh, just utilize all your skills sitting in that chair. That's what and uh, studio musicians are, have to be some of the best musicians in the world. Yeah, absolutely. And they they because they come in and they sight read. You know, they come in don't know what to expect out of a production. So uh, uh, I was thrilled to to sit there next to him. As I played session after session, those first few uh, weeks or whatever, because they called me constantly, constantly. They liked what I, what I did uh, with my instrument. So they called me back again and again and again. But uh, boy, it really showed me, uh, sitting in the midst of the Funk Brothers and, and next to, the, to all those great musicians, the horn players, it showed me what the chemistry was and how difficult it was to, to get that exact chemistry and mix for a hit record. It's, I really gained a lot of respect for it. You know, it takes a lot of stamina to sit there and say, take take 10, take 15, take 20, you know? Yeah. Uh, it takes a lot of stamina and you have to just have to be at your, at your best to sit in that chair. So it, it taught you discipline and it, and it uh, built up your chops. Did it also, uh, did you eventually gain an appreciation for R&B? Oh, absolutely, because I found found out uh, what a what a distinct chemistry it takes to get those everything to working together, like the the uh, rhythm, the horn parts, the uh, um, rhythm section working independent of one another, and then at times working all together in, in a, like an ensemble section. They were basically soloists. See these funk brothers. Uh, the keyboard players, Larry Van Dyke, uh, Johnny Griffith, Joe Hunter, um, uh, Joe Messina guitar, uh, Eddie Willis, Robert White guitar, Dennis Coffey guitar, uh, James Jamerson bass, Bob Babbitt bass, you know, these are all pretty much skilled positions, you know, soloists in their own right, but they came together and made that sound whenever they sat in those chairs together. Yeah. You were, um, you know, featured uh, along with those other funk brothers you mentioned in the 2002 movie Standing in the Shadows of Motown. Uh, how often do you speak with, uh, you know, the surviving funk brothers nowadays? Well, uh, for those that are left, we're talking about uh, Jack Ashford, Joe Messina, Dennis Coffey, and myself. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Do you guys have like Literally. a... Literally. Do you guys have like a Facebook group or anything like that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's amazing. We just lost uh, Wawa Watson also and Eddie Willis uh, about a month and a half, two months apart. See, two great guitarists, you know. You know, they like I said, they're all uh, what, what you call individualists in their own right. You know, all of them like, were like soloists. They, they had a style of their own. Yes. What about some of the Motown recording artists themselves who, you know, are surviving again? Uh, you know, Diana Ross, Stevie Wonder comes to mind. Um, uh, Martha Reeves, do you speak with any of them? You ever hear from any of them? Oh, yes. Martha Reeves is uh, one of my greatest personal friends. Uh, in fact, when I first came to Motown, she was working as a secretary at that time. She is the one who had to come downstairs and sign me in at 17 years old. Okay. Wow. All right. Yes. Yes. So she and I have bonded. Uh, Kim Weston, I'm still in touch with. Ivy Hunter, Ivy Joe Hunter. Otis Williams, Temptations, of course. Duke Fakir, okay, of the Four Tops. 
God, I'm going down my list here. The the Velvets, Johnny Trudell, uh, one of my favorite friends. Dennis Coffey, of course. Yeah. Joe Messina, still in touch with. Oh yeah. That's great. So the list goes on and on. Mary Wilson, uh, Diana Ross. Uh, the list goes on. Stevie Wonder, of course. You know. Those ties uh, remain all these years later to a certain extent. Jer, my uh, partner here at Daily Detroit, one of his favorite songs that you worked on uh, is the 1970s Stevie Wonder hit, Sign Sealed, Delivered, I'm Yours. Um, I mean, who, who doesn't love that song, right? What, oh, yeah. What are your memories of uh, of working with Stevie Wonder uh, and the Funk Brothers on that song? Well, well Stevie, of course, is the uh, consummate gen- genius. Um, just a wonderful person, personality-wise. Never gets anxious in, in a creative setting. Patient, extremely patient, wonderful person, and uh, um, uh, a jokester, practical joke, jokester. Just a lot of fun, you know, and uh, he's so secure in his music also. Usually what you hear on those records is because he specifically thought those parts out. Every note, literally every note, the voicings and all. Oh, yeah, he's genius. So he, he had a heavy hand in the arranging himself then? Well, uh, you know, a, a good songwriter has certain things in within their their music. Uh, if they're, I mean, if they're keyboardists also, and, and they write, they exhibit certain styles and certain things, which if if you're really thinking good as an arranger, you'll capture some of that. See, you don't want to you don't want to go out too far outside of of uh, a person like Stevie Wonder. Okay. And as far as arranging and now you want to stay within the confines of that song. And uh, uh, it's like putting icing on the cake, literally. Any favorite songs that you had in arra- you know, hand arranging uh, or playing on um, from back in the Motown uh, era? Oh, that's a loaded question. Let me see. <laughs> uh, of course, my Sharia Moore, speaking of Stevie. Yep, yep. Uh, Pop was a Rolling Stone. Uh and one high enough, of course. Uh, oh God, the list, the list. Um, reach out and touch. Also, oh God. <laughs> you, you know, you, when when these kind of questions come up, I draw, I draw a real blank. The list is long. You know what I'm saying? There's so many classic Motown songs. Yes, Sugar Pie Honey Bunch, Four Did Times. Did you do Grapevine from that? Grapevine, yeah. yeah. Both versions of Grapevine. Absolutely. One thing that's amazing about about Motown, you know, the sound is that it it's so timeless and it, you know, those songs sound as great nowadays as they did back then. You know, this might be something you cover in your class tomorrow, but what what to your mind what makes a a great classic song, like a timeless song? Wow. Let's see. Well, first of all, it's got to have um a a, a decent chord structure. Doesn't take much uh Shouldn't take much uh, adjusting to make it work. Melody, of course. Rhythm, melodic rhythm. It has to have a, a certain feel to it. Uh, uh, and as a demo, it has to have a sense of marketability even at that stage, you know, as a demo stage. You can feel it. You can almost feel a, a, a potential hit. You can feel it. Oh, interesting. So what about uh, contemporary music? Uh, wh- what's your jam? Who are you listening to nowadays that uh, you particularly like? I like Bruno Mars, of course. I love Luther, as he, his style all along, but he wouldn't be considered a contemporary artist, as, as you, uh, you're asking. You're talking about L- Luther Vandross? Yeah, Luther Vandross. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Now, now, a lot of the, uh, the the modern music of contemporary stuff, I got to say it very frankly, is a lot of it is underproduced, okay? Good songs, uh, but they seem like they've stopped in the budgetary side of things and just refuse to go further, they refuse to sp- spend the money that's necessary to take it to that next level, you see? Oh, I hear a lot of that on the radio, a lot of it, see? Good songs... But uh, what they don't realize is that uh, by adding certain elements to it, it could maybe account for maybe another half million sales even, you know, uh, just by adding adding uh, another flavor. But uh, these writers a lot of times don't, don't realize it. And uh, 
a lot of the production houses, they, um, they feel that if you can get it cheaply, why put more money to it, see? They, uh, in fact, I, I've had a couple of people explain to me that the less they spend, the better, you know? And that, to me, is, is really, uh, it's really uh, dumbing down the, the listeners. I really feel like it is. That's what I feel about most of this contemporary music. Yeah. Interesting, interesting, yeah. Uh, so so what do you tell young musicians, I'm sure you'll get this question tomorrow, um, who are looking to make a career out of music today, you know, given all the challenges that we've talked about? I would instruct them, first of all, if you're going to write a song, write it with, uh, with conviction and not just to be trendy. Write a good song, you know. They think they're making money. Of course, they make they make flash money nowadays. I call it. It's uh, in fact, I call it stupid money. Sometimes it's so fast and big. Okay, but if they write songs that are going to be covered decades down the line, centuries down the line, uh, you know, uh, that's where they really make real money. See, if they're covered by other artists and. Uh, out of the, out of their uh, genre, like say if it goes to uh, a R&B song, which goes to a pop artist or or uh, one of the, one of the classic Tony Bennett type artists, Frank Sinatra type artists, they can do a song like that. Um, you, look at Steve. Steve is a prime example of that. He's written so many songs that have crossed over, you know, see, and just crossed over into other genres, <laughs> other fields, other uh, other areas of music, you know. Jazz, uh, uh, um, um, uh, uh, country and western, even you know, and, and he's just a great writer. Smokey has done pretty much the same thing, also, because so, they 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 believe in the good song. You have to start with a good song, good lyrics, good strong lyrics. E- easier said than done, though, right? Oh, it's a, it's an art to it, truly an art. I want to bring in uh, Kevin Nixon, the president of Dime. Kevin, how did you land uh, Mr. Riser? And I guess this is part of your artist in residence program there at uh, at the Institute of Music Education. That's right, and we're very, very uh, grateful that Paul agreed to do that this year. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we're very careful about who we bring in here because we we are in a privileged position to be able to influence the next generation of musicians in Detroit, and so. We only want to give them, first of all, the best, but we also want to give them positivity. And anybody that's had a kind of a bitter experience in the music industry, that's not the message you want to get across. Uh, Somebody like Paul, is it's hard to actually beat his CV. He's very modest, but um, I'd only probably think of Quincy Jones, who has topped you as an arranger, Paul. Mm -hmm. And um, I was buying all your records in the north of England as a kid. And so I know all of them, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. So, you know, you want to get that brilliance and that enthusiasm, yes. but most of all, the spontaneity, because, yes. you know, the biggest difference I find, uh, before I, I started in music education 18 years ago, I was a producer for 15 years, and mm-hmm. before that I was actually a session player as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and the biggest difference is the amount of time you get in the studio, because, um, you know, you got people these days and sometimes go in the studio for two years to make 45 minutes worth of music. That's right. I find that very frustrating because I worked with some amazing producers when I was a kid in England, like Mickey Most. And if you didn't have a a hit by dinner time, you didn't get hired the next day. (laughs) So having that ability to not just come up with the stuff, but then to deliver it with, with the right spirit, and to get energy on those recordings. Yes. You know, Paul's yes. a trombone player first mm. and an arranger second, so he knows mm-hmm. how to perform. Yes. So many times you get in the studio and it's a frustrating thing because the guys are not up to the level. That's know? true. Yeah. yeah. So space still open uh, tomorrow for the Paul Riser Masterclass, I understand, from 1 to 3 down at uh, the Dime campus? Yeah, we, anyone can come mm-hmm. along and anyone's welcome at Dime. Um even though you know we we study at degree level, so it's kind of a it's a music industry university really. Um, any age group as well, you know. One of the great things about someone as experienced as Paul is that if you're a, a 19 or 20 year old student here, you very rarely get a chance to meet somebody of Paul's experience. 
And so, you know, it, you can be in your third. I mean, every time I'm with him, I always come away learning something. So, mm-hmm. and I'm 62 now. So it doesn't really matter what age you are. Come That's down true. and listen. You're welcome. All right. Uh, well, Paul Reiser, the legendary Motown funk brother, and Kevin Nixon, president of the Detroit Institute of Med- Music Education. Thanks so much to you both for coming on Daily Detroit today. Well, thank you. Thank you. And come on and come on. Yeah, really enjoyed talking with you. I think I'm going to come uh, try to come down myself tomorrow. Well, that'll do it for today's show, friends. Hope you enjoyed our conversation with Paul Reiser, the Funk Brother, and Kevin Nixon of Dime as much as I did. If you like our show, tell a friend about it. Help us get the word out. Or support our work at patreon.com slash dailydetroit. And of course, some thanks are in order as this is our last show for the week. Nuri Gojai, Daily Detroit's world traveler and spirits advisor. Randy Walker, who makes awesome Slack emoji for us. Cheyenne Nosserini, who's doing a great job editing audio. And of course, you. Thank you for listening. I'm Jer Stays. And I'm Sven Gustafson. Take care of one another, keep on keeping on, and we'll see you around Detroit. You're listening to the Podcast Detroit Network. Visit www.podcastdetroit.com for more information.